to The Fitterist Show with your host, Christopher Allen, where we explore the art of mind and body conditioning. In this episode, we take a look at ClassPass, the internet startup that gives consumers a discount rate while helping boutique exercise studios fill empty slots in classes. Sounds like a win-win, so what could possibly go wrong with this model for the latest billion-dollar internet unicorn? Also, we dive into BMI, or body mass index, that basic metric that is used to measure a person's body fat at a very high level. However, there are some non-trivial flaws with the BMI measurement that you should be aware of and know as a part of your overall fitness and health program. So let's dive in. Our first news story. Comes to us from an article in Vice, whose headline is that ClassPass is squeezing studios to the point of death. So let's take a step back. At the start of 2020, the fitness startup ClassPass delivered great news. According to its most recent funding round, which was $285 million in January of 2020, the company was now valued at more than $1 billion, earning it the enviable honor of becoming the first unicorn of the decade over that $1 billion valuation. So ClassPass actually launched in 2013, and it made a name for itself by helping boutique studios and gyms and exercise studios fill empty slots in classes. Over the years, it's experienced some growing pains with its business models, switching from an unlimited plan to a tiered membership model, later changing again to a credit-based system in 2018. But in the past 18 months or so, the company has really been growing. It's expanded from four to 28 different countries, and it now boasts more than 30,000 boutique studio, gym, and wellness partners. And that funding, which had been rumored throughout the end of last year, will be used as the management has indicated to fuel its expansion abroad and grow its corporate partnership program. Its corporate partnership program is where ClassPass partners with businesses, and they have over 1,000 to date, And those businesses then provide ClassPass memberships to their employees as a health benefit and perk. So the investment round was led by Apex Digital and El Catterton, which, not a surprise to this space, they have been an investor in Peloton, Tonal, Pure Bar, and Equinox. So no strangers to the space from the investment standpoint. So let's talk a little bit about the challenge with the business boutique partners, because the premise of this is an interesting one in that you have a symbiotic relationship between class pass and the boutique owners. So boutique owners of fitness studios would accept class pass students into their classes a few times a month at rates far below what they would ask for direct or walk on consumers in exchange. The company class pass offered studios, free marketing a few extra customers, and the hope that ClassPass students might eventually convert to full-paying direct members directly with the studio and not through ClassPass. Stay tuned. So as an example, like many of the other studio owners, you could see where a yoga or Pilates studio was intrigued by this prospect of partnering with ClassPass, which by way of example, they would get about a little over $12 per student, which was less than, in this example, the $16 that the owner of the yoga studio received from a direct consumer. But the studio owner still had total control over how much inventory she would allocate to class pass. So what classes and what teachers or how many spots was all in control of the boutique studio owner. Further, when class pass was starting out, the ClassPass students could only attend a particular studio three times a month, which meant that the service worked well as a free and limited kind of marketing tool. So if you liked the studio, the owner could work with ClassPass and the individual to convert them to a direct paying member, i.e. a higher margin, longer sustainable direct relationship from the studio owner with a customer. ClassPass agreed in this model to also promote the studio In effect, kind of providing some advertising, a halo advertising to help drive new members to their partner studios. 
seems like a good win-win at this point. And on the customer side, the benefit was even simpler. ClassPass early on would charge $99 for 10 monthly boutique fitness classes, which on their own could cost around $35 a session. So for the consumer, it was a killer deal. Later, ClassPass would expand the model to allow for a month of unlimited classes for that same price. The subscription model, which everybody in the internet is going toward, subscription model made it so that ClassPass customers could attend a cheap yoga class on Tuesday, a cheap spin class on Wednesday, and another class on Thursday. So this strategy really kind of started to make ClassPass gain momentum in the space and really started to build up their brand in this fitness segment. Exercise enthusiasts joined the platform and studios followed. And pretty soon, ClassPass, by 2015, after again having just been founded in 2013, so in two years, they've made more than 4 million reservations at more than 4,000 studios around the country. So the deals, from again, from the consumer side, seem almost too good to be true. The question, though, was, was this a sustainable business model? So as ClassPass continued to grow, the studios, partner studios, kind of contended that, hey, ClassPass is basically getting consumers hooked on this ongoing discounted price, similar to what MoviePass did in the media and entertainment vertical as a theatrical movie subscription model that was just way underpriced, not sustainable, and they just filed for Chapter 7. But ClassPass, in its massive expansion, was still worried about how much it was spending on these classes. So there were some internal documents that were obtained that showed that in February of 2016, ClassPass's projected annual revenue was around $122 million. But they also noted that the company was making about 300,000 reservations a week with an average studio payout rate of around $12 and change, which if you do the math, amounted to about $187 million paid out to the studios in a single year, meaning that the company was paying out more than it was taking in. Hard to make that up in volume. So faced with that data, ClassPass decided, hey, let's try to raise the price of the hugely popular unlimited class plan, which they tried to do for a little bit, they got a ton of backlash, and then, of course, they had to make the decision to do away with it entirely because, not surprisingly, it was completely unsustainable. You're taking in X dollars, you're paying out Y, which is much greater than X. Again, can't make it up in volume. So users were a little bit upset, but clearly the business model was, for ClassPass, just wasn't working. So by March of 2017, the founder had stepped down as the CEO, and ClassPass started to announce some changes with the intent of getting to a sustainable long-term business model. So the company formally switched over to a credits-based system where the students paid the same amount every month in exchange for a fixed amount of credits, but they could then spend those credits however they wished. So a Thursday night spin class might cost a customer 12 credits while a Monday afternoon yoga class might only cost five credits. So this switch kind of solved the problem and made cheaper classes more appealing to customers, which helped ClassPass because they weren't paying as much out to the studio owners. Also as part of these changes, ClassPass decided, a la Uber and others, to introduce surge pricing. So it would no longer limit the number of times one ClassPass customer could attend his favorite studio and allow people to pay more credits to go to premium classes during high demand and peak class times. They had to make some of these changes. With more spots available, customers now had less reason to leave the platform because they could go to a variety of in-demand classes and cheaper classes. Now, the studios, though, also began to rely on ClassPass for a significant and growing percentage of their revenue. So additional challenges. So what you've got is... ClassPass would say the number one reason people leave the ClassPass platform is to join a studio directly. But here's the challenge. By staying on the ClassPass platform, consumers were getting a better deal. Because with such a large discrepancy between what ClassPass and the studios charge for the classes, ClassPass users are just going to not become full-paying direct customers when they could just continue to pay through ClassPass and get a discounted rate. 
they almost never would convert to being a member of a yoga studio. And what rational customer would? You're basically getting a huge incentive to go through the ClassPass platform because you're buying things at a 50 to 60% discount right off the top. So studios had little chance of kind of converting ClassPass users. And now ClassPass started to know that. And under the new model, the company's pitch to these boutique studios started to shift. It was no longer to find potential customers. Rather, they fully changed their proposition to say that we let partners opaquely clear excess capacity, i.e. fill up their empty class slots without letting the customers see that price. So at prices that maximize the partner's overall revenue with no effort, no marketing spend, no customer service costs. So that's their PR statement. And the double whammy to the fitness studio was that with fewer limits on those ClassPass customers, <laughs> boutique studio owners found that their direct sign-up dedicated students, subscribers who had not used ClassPass, they were already direct subscribers, would quit the boutique directly and come back the next day as a ClassPass member just to save the money. They basically just switched over because it is literally cheaper. So you can see as a studio owner, you're in a bit of a conundrum. You've got a large flow of new customers coming in via ClassPass platform. And of course, you've also got the negative of existing direct customers going to ClassPass as well. But you are also getting additional people to fill out your studio slots. So what did ClassPass do? Well, they started cranking up the leverage of their backend platform. So ClassPass said, hey, why don't we come up with dynamic pricing technology, which they dubbed Smart Rate. And this basically allowed each studio to agree to a price floor and a price ceiling. And then the ClassPass algorithm, the Smart Rate, would deduce exactly what price would draw in the most total revenue at any one moment. In conjunction with that, ClassPass also came up with something called Smart Spot, which the company described as an automated spot management technology that basically looks at the reservation history of the club to understand how you typically fill out your classes, when they fill out, how many last minute walk-ins you get, and allow this Smart Spot technology to make real-time adjustments to add or remove the number of spots you release on ClassPass. So remember before, the boutique owner could say, I'm only giving 12 spots in each class as an example, to ClassPass. But with SmartSpot, it looks at all of the spots for every class and will optimize that for all of the class spots. So the difference here is that the studio owners lost a little bit of control. And so they were a little bit reliant on ClassPass to not list spots that they would otherwise normally fill with direct clients. So by adopting SmartSpot, that's the trade-off. So while it was initially an option, in December of 2019, ClassPass basically said, we are turning on SmartSpot for all of your schedules. They just forced all partners over full inventory to be managed by SmartSpot. The premise would be, hey, we'll save you time, will automatically release inventory at the right time at the right price to maximize revenue for both of us. Sounds like a win-win. What could go wrong? Well, a couple things. ClassPass also said, if you remember back in the early days, they say, hey, we'll work with you, boutique fitness owner, to market to and convert ClassPass subscribers and ClassPass members to become full-paying members of your boutique. Now, ClassPass said in December 2019 that due to privacy laws, that ClassPass would not be able to share any co customer contact information to try to convert them to regular paying, direct paying subscribers, and that the studio and boutique owners have to do it themselves. Now, just putting more onus on the studio owners, giving up pricing control, giving up inventory control, and forcing them to try to convert on their own members who were coming in on a ClassPass to become direct paying subscribers at arguably and inevitably a higher price. That's a tough one. So what happened after Skynet, or sorry, ClassPass took over all of the booking? Basically, there were a lot of low price reservations and 
the studios were full, they had more reservations, but at significantly reduced prices. And so what happened is full paying members were pissed off because their classes were extremely full of novices and new people. And because of the lower rates that most, the majority of people were coming in, as an example, a typical a studio revenue was down about 30% because class pass and its dynamic pricing system had cut the per student average nearly in half to below $10 per student. So now this dramatic price drop has caused an ever-growing number of former direct customers, again, to convert even more so to ClassPass, putting even further downward pressure on a studio's overall revenue. So in some cases, you had revenue drop 17 25%, even though their classes were relatively full. So overall, it's kind of a tricky proposition. Look, as a small exercise studio business owner, you're starting to get a non-trivial number of customers from ClassPass. That's going to be a good thing. But that customer volume comes at a revenue expense. Plus, the challenge of trying to convert a patron to what is essentially a higher price model puts studio owners in a precarious spot. From a marketing and CRM perspective, the studio owner loses control of a number of their customers. And also lost is the ability to control class inventory spots and overall pricing, except via their class pass agreement with floors and ceilings. So, if class pass gains complete control over studio inventory, and continues to put downward pressure on price, then the physical location studios will be hard-pressed to survive given a lot of their other overhead expenses. So you still have to pay rent. A lot of these are in prime locations with non-trivial rent. You have to pay instructor salaries, office personnel, equipment for the members, cleaning, all of those things that are incumbent on the studio owner to pay, and none of which are fees that ClassPass has. So many studio owners... Remain confident in their physical location. Look, location is still a big driver of where people decide to go, where people decide to work out. But justifiably concerned with a partner, quote, partner, that controls so many key aspects of their business. As such, look, some have opted out of ClassPass, taken that hit, and those customers or ClassPass members go elsewhere, but they've instituted, some of those owners have instituted their own kind of class packs at a slight discount to improve loyalty and retention. But the vast majority, fair to note, vast majority of studios remain with the ClassPass platform, at least for now. Our second news story is about the flaws of body mass index or BMI measurement. So let's take a quick look at the history. BMI was invented in the 1830s for use in population studies. And in 1972, there was a study that tested for the best formula to measure body fat percentages in more than 7,500 people. And they found that the BMI formula best measured body fat percentage as compared to merely calculating weight and height charts. It was this study that gave BMI its official name and what popularized its use in research. However, even that study back in 1972 also warned against using BMI to calculate an individual's level of fat. So even with that little bit of cautionary tale, a handful of national and international government agencies then started to recommend that doctors use BMI as it would be a uniform standard, which is, look, uniform standards are always good, and was seen as a more accurate than the height-weight charts that the doctors had been using historically. And in 1985, the U.S. National Institution of Health recommended BMI to measure obesity. In 1997, the World Health Organization jumped on the bandwagon. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, which sets guidelines for American medical professionals, still includes BMI in its measurement recommendations. So basically, every doctor measures BMI. When you go to the doctor and they weigh you in and measure your height, your BMI shows up on that doctor chart. And it's not only doctors who use it. As the childhood obesity epidemic grew and continues to grow, more than a dozen states started to require schools to chart students' BMIs, with some even recording the measurement on report cards. That sounds a little excessive. Life insurance company may also ask for BMI to determine whether you should get a policy or you're too big of a risk. Yet, while the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention call 
BMI a reasonable indicator of body fat, the agency does not recommend that doctors or anyone else for that matter use it as an actual diagnostic tool. And we'll start to see some of those reasons why BMI is not a good diagnostic tool. But before we do that, let's learn how to calculate your BMI. So first, divide your weight in pounds by your height in inches squared, and then multiply that number by 703. I didn't come up with a formula, just saying what it is. For me, I will take 210 pounds divided by 73. I'm 61210, so I'll take 210 divided by 73 squared, which is 0.0394, and then I multiply that by 703 to get 27.7. So the scale for BMI is if you're below 18.5, you're considered, quote, underweight. Between 18.5 to 24.9, you're, quote, normal. 25 to 29.9, you are, quote, overweight. 30 and higher, you are obese. And there are actual obese one, because our, our nation is so fat, we actually go up in other classes to obese one, obese two, close to uh, a 40 BMI. So according to the standard table, I'm overweight, creeping pretty close into obesity. However, I carry more muscle than the average person. You can see pictures of me on Instagram under Fitteris Mind Body or CA is the house for reference. I have traditionally had an ectomorphic body and probably am actually not that close to obese in reality. A little sarcasm there. Why do so many people use BMI? Well, the most exact ways to measure obesity can be expensive. So BMI became the, you know, the next best thing we can do for adults. But I think it's important to think of it as only one of several screening tools that helps kind of show a quick glance that this person's health may possibly be hurt by their weight. So it's an important thing to measure to potentially look more deeply. Clearly more measurements would be needed to tell the entire story. And that's because BMI doesn't distinguish between fat and muscle, which could be a really big problem for someone who's athletic. That's why mine's inflated, I hope. The average football player, for instance, has a BMI of 31, which is considered obese by these standards, yet many of these athletes are world-class, packing tons of muscle, and the average player probably does not have a level of fat that would actually threaten their health. It's really indirect measure of body fat that doesn't take into account important details about age, about sex, bone structure, fat distribution. We shouldn't be as worried about weight for example, you could have gone on a fad diet and lost three pounds. It doesn't necessarily make you healthier. Those three pounds could have just been water weight. What we really need to be worried about is the fat and where your fat is concentrated, the distribution of fat in your body. And BMI completely misses that level of detail. Another group that often gets odd BMI scores is children. So you've got children that are hitting growth spurts and BMI is off a non-trivial amount of the time. The BMI measurements used for children are weighted for age, but when boys go through puberty or girls go through puberty, they add muscle at a rapid rate. BMI tends to miss these little nuances. It can also miss subtle racial differences. People, certain races tend to carry more muscle than fat. So BMI, again, misses most of those. Okay, if BMI is not great, what should we use? Well, one of the most exact ways to measure obesity is either an MRI or x-ray, which can clearly distinguish between fat and other innards, but that's expensive. And regular radiation exposure is not super advised, so hospitals and doctors are trying a variety of methods and tools. There's other techniques. There's underwater analysis, in which patients are submerged in a tank of water to calculate their body volume, their body density, and overall body fat. But this too... It's very time-consuming. It's very labor-intensive calculation and process, even though it is more accurate. Some hospitals use a highly accurate machine for a bioelectrical impedance analysis, which runs electric current through the body tissue to determine fat composition. They take measurements based on body volume. However, you see a lot of these in the drugstore, 
built into scales, most of those are very imprecise and not recommended for any level of accuracy. And again, sometimes simpler is better. Doctors also suggest just busting out the tape measure. Measure your circumference at your belly button. If your waist circumference is half your height or less, you're generally okay. And if you're over that number, so if your waist circumference is more than half your height, you could be at risk for some ill health. Another simple tool is just look at your hip to waist ratio. It's something a doctor could even just eyeball quickly. And basically it's a red flag if the waist measurement is larger than the hip measurement. So there's a couple different things in there from very basic to very precise. So in summary, BMI is pretty much an outdated way of determining a person's body health. It's a measurement that shouldn't really be used in a school setting where students are already self-conscious and lacking confidence in their unique bodies. They could be hitting a growth spurt, all of a sudden be labeled obese and send them into a tailspin. So you have to be careful with using BMI and how you couch it with everyone, but particularly with children. You can quickly tell if you have a good doctor. I think if he or she mentions the obvious flaws of the BMI calculation, doesn't just look at the number and say, well, you need to go on a diet. If they don't, it might be time to get another doctor. While some people call BMI the BS measuring index, it can be a directional data point to further analyze an individual for their true risk of obesity. But don't over-rely on this single data point with its well-known flaws to characterize yourself. That said, we can't stick our head in the sand around the 40% of the U.S. population that is obese. Whether that's on a slightly flawed BMI calculation or not, obesity is real, and that macro trend is larger than a potentially slightly flawed BMI measurement calculation. Now, hopefully advances in medical technology will provide a much more accurate, cost-effective measurement of fat that includes or at least accounts for things like measurement of body fat content, muscle mass, bone density, overall body composition and fat distribution, and racial and gender differences. All of these are important to get a true picture of where you stand from a body mass index and from overall fat perspective. With that, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to The Fitterist Show. You can follow us on Instagram at Fitterist Mind Body and on Twitter at Fitterist Mind. If you enjoyed this episode, please send it to a friend or subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes of The Fitterist Show. My name is Christopher Allen, and make it a magical day.